Theory is History by Javis Banaji. This is Chapter 9, Islam, the Mediterranean, and the Rise of Capitalism. 9.1. Historiographies of Capital. Our conception of capitalist origins has been so heavily dominated by the so-called transition debate that Marxists are apt to forget that the first debate on origins actually began with the publication of the first edition of Sumbart's Modern Capitalism and the various responses to its major argument that agrarian wealth or the accumulation of ground rent provided the chief source of the fortunes that financed capitalist expansion in Europe. For Sumbart, the aristocracies of Europe played the leading role in the evolution of industrial capitalism, and even colonial capitalism was to a large extent the work of these aristocratic entrepreneurs. The earliest, system, the earliest systematic response systematic response to Sumbart's thesis was Jacob Strider's seminal and, in some ways, still unsurpassed book, Studen zur Getschicht Kapitalistischer Organisationsformen, from 1914. Strider strongly believed that the first large-scale capitalist enterprises in industry, particularly mining, were financed and controlled by merchants, and this could be shown for the South German mining industry of the 15th and 16th century. Three aspects of Strider's argument are worth noting. First, that the mining industry played a seminal role in the evolution of modern capitalism. Second, that merchants created large enterprises that is, involved themselves in the organization of production and industry. And finally, the more general thesis that commercial capitalism lay at the origin of the so-called capitalist spirit several centuries earlier in Venice, Florence, and other centers of early capitalism. The last of these theses became the focus of a subsequent paper, which Strider published in 1929, called Origin and Evolution of Early European Capitalism. Here, he argued that in a whole series of industries, the woolen goods, silk weaving, linen export, and metal industries, the merchant who organized the export trade and made advances in one form or another to the workmen, gained control over industries which had previously been in the hands of independent craftsmen. The evolution was, of course, particularly advanced in Italy, where the forms of money and credit economy inherited from the ancient world had kept their vitality. This is a particularly interesting idea because the legacies of late antiquity are seen here as unmediated. There is, if you like, an unbroken line of descent from the ancient world to medieval capitalism, and the story is purely European. In the same year, Earl Hamilton proposed his now famous argument that while many factors contributed to the rise of modern capitalism, chief among these were the discoveries and the vast influx of gold and silver from American mines. His main thesis, of course, was that transatlantic flows boosted profitability for employers by triggering, triggering a price inflation. But Hamilton also suggested a causal connection between American treasure and the East India trade, arguing that Portugal, Holland, England, and France were able to finance their trade expansion in the East, thanks to the vast influx of precious metals from Mexico and Peru, and the ability of those countries to attract the largest, largest share of this metallic mass. Unlike Strider, however, all of these developments were simply seen as factors in the rise of modern capitalism, that is, presuppositions of capital rather than movements of enterprises, um, presupposing capital. The close connection between the East India trade and American treasure and the rise of modern capitalism has been overlooked or neglected largely because Portugal, the first nation to profit from trade with the Spice Islands by the Cape Route, and Spain, the recipient of American gold and silver, showed no significant progress toward capitalism. When Hamilton says no significant progress toward capitalism, he clearly means industrial capitalism. Yet Hamilton's main contribution was to draw attention to the Atlantic. By 1932, Portuguese historians could suggest that the countries of the Atlantic seaboard were the true founders of modern capitalism. The great centers of modern capitalism were Lisbon and Antwerp, and a deeply provocative formulation 
Vega Simos wrote, The whole of the new commercial life and even the capitalist system stem fundamentally from Portuguese economic policy at the end of the 14th and beginning of the 15th centuries. I shall argue that this is basically correct in the speculative core of a more internationalist historiography of capitalism than that implied in the transition debate. Portugal straddled two phases of commercial capitalism, subordinating the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, and then the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Yet Portugal's imperial adventure began as a confrontation with the commercial networks of Islam, an attempt to undermine those networks internationally. In his brilliant and much neglected book, O Capitalismo Monarchico Portugues, subtitled Contribution to a Study of the Origins of Modern Capitalism, Manuel Nunes Diaz argued, <coughs> argued that with the conquest of the Dark Sea, Europe overthrew the Mediterranean frameworks that had shackled her progress. In the great ocean lay the engine that drove her capitalism. Behind the capture of Cuda, in 1415 lay the whole weight of the incipient commercial capitalism of the later Middle Ages and its relentless fascination with the specter of, of African gold. The political victory of the bourgeoisie in 1440, raising Dom Pedro to the, to the throne of Portugal, inaugurated a period of intense activity along the Atlantic coast of Africa, signifying the strategic triumph of maritime expansion over territorial imperialism and enabling Henry the Navigator to implement his policy of deflecting the Sudan-Sahara traffic from the desert routes to the Atlantic. Through its progressive capture of the Atlantic, Portugal emerged as the most active representative of the nascent commercial capitalism of the Christian West. By the time Dom Zhao II ascended the throne in 1481, Portugal was Europe's first colonial power the driving force of a capitalist revolution of far-flung trading establishments buttressed by military fortresses. The Portuguese became pioneers of the modern colonial system, harnessing the crusader tradition of a marginalized aristocracy within the peculiar fusion of crown and commercial capitalism, which Diaz calls monarchical capitalism, with its chief international center at Antwerp, at Antwerp the headquarters of modern capitalism. The gold shipped from São Jorge de Mina raised Portugal's credit rating and consolidated the power of the monarchy, creating the crucial basis for expansion to the east. This is hardly a fair summary of a book that runs into 1,097 pages and one which even Bradell seems largely to have ignored. What is striking in Diaz is not just the sense that capitalism was a thoroughly international system from its inception, and that the problems confronted by Portugal were problems that all of European capitalism was keen to solve, above all the scarcity of gold. But the much less obvious idea that Portugal's Atlantic expansion began in fact as an assault on Islamic commercial supremacy, both its domination of the Sahara gold trade and its monopoly of the Indian Ocean. The legacies of late antiquity were retrieved in different ways by Islam, and the Italian city republics, and the dynamics of European capitalism are incomprehensible without some attempt to understand those totalizations. Here, the late 1960s saw two significant contributions. In Societa e Stato nel Medio Mediova Ven Veneziano, Secoli, I don't know, something, something, Giorgio Craco developed a brilliant analysis of the power of commercial capital in the Venetian Republic of the 12th and 13th centuries. The fierce domination of the commune by, um, of the commune, uh, by an oligarchy of capitalists whose fortunes were tied up with international trade. The Venetian Republic was a Stato de Mercanti, a Stato de Grandi Capitalisti, based by the middle decades of the 13th century on a huge concentration of capital that narrowed the social and political base of the mercantile economy and the relentless subordination of all sectors not directly bound up with the Levant traffic. 
Finally, in a paper published in 1969, Subi Labib argued that capitalism was able to develop much earlier in the Islamic regions than, than in the Occident, largely because the Muslim Mediterranean could build on the continuing traditions of late antiquity, unlike the West, or unlike the West with a question mark. Labib referred to Islamic capitalism, the medieval capitalistic trade of Islam, to trading companies, bills of exchange, big business, etc., and thought that the failure of the state to sustain these structures led to their progressive unraveling by the later Middle Ages. 9.2 Towards a Marxist Theory of Commercial Capitalism Marxist capital is premised on the primacy of industrial capital. This means that, with the evolution of industrial capitalism, the other varieties of capital which appeared previously are not only subordinated to it, and correspondingly altered in the mechanism of their functioning, but they now move only on its basis, thus live and die, stand and fall together with this basis. The merchant or merchant capitalist is simply a circulation agent of industrial capital, a form or branch of industrial capital, lacking any independent existence. Marx also seems to suggest that under industrial capitalism, Commercial capital is increasingly stripped of all the heterogeneous functions that may be linked to it, such as storage, dispatch, disport, distribution, and retailing, and confined to its true function of buying in order to sell. Thus, commercial capital is simply a specialized form of the circulation functions of industrial capital, and no independent system can be construed for it. But this conception of commercial capital is clearly inapplicable to the historical trajectories associated with the international traders or merchant financiers who dominated the earlier history of capitalism. It is the definition of the nature and functions of commercial capital that presupposes the circuit of industrial capital or the dominance of large-scale industry, a situation that was only finally realized as late as the 19th century. And it seems logically absurd to me to imagine that a history of capitalism can be written using a notion of commercial capital that was developed by Marx for the kind of capitalist economy that evolved only in the 19th century. In practice, of course, this is largely what has tended to happen. The most striking case of this is Maurice Daub, who referred sneeringly to the Pogrovsky bog of merchant capitalism, conceived of capitalism in essentially national terms, and sought to understand origins in terms of factors peculiar to England. There is a methodological impasse at work here, a staggering confusion of history and logic that, that accounts for the singular inability of Marxists influenced by Daub to confront the past of capitalism beyond such manifestly untenable assertions as the capitalist system was born in England, only in England did capitalism emerge, and the early modern period as an indigenous national economy, or by its very nature, merchant capital must attach itself to a system of production. Daub was evidently mesmerized by the distinction between production and exchange, generalizing this into an alleged contrast between capitalism as a commercial system and capitalism as a mode of production. Central to the latter was productive activity on the basis of a wage contract, Men of capital, however acquisitive, are not enough. Their capital must be used to yoke labor to the creation of surplus value in production. Methodologically, there was at least two interesting responses to this kind of reasoning. Reviewing studies in the very year that saw Sweezy and Daub publish their exchange in Science and Society, Tawney suggested that the restricted sense of capitalism which Daub favored eliminated a great deal of the history of capitalism and even led at times to a misconception of the significance of the part played by capitalist interests in periods when an industrial wage system was in this country in its infancy. Dobb underestimated the strength of capitalist interests in the century before the English Civil War. George Lefebvre's excellent contribution to the transition debate sidestepped the antithesis by suggesting that, even in England, the merchants played a more decisive role in the evolution of capitalism than Dobb was willing to allow for, and ended with a plea for renewed interrogation of the sources. The dominant sector of capital had no thought of overturning the social and political order. 
Indeed, it was the collusion between commerce and the state that promoted the development of capitalism. The metho methodological step forward in Lefebvre's critique is the explicit move away from the wholly abstract opposition between production and circulation, or merchants and manufacture. The merchant created manufacturers. His interests coincided with those of the state and of the great landowners who were enclosing estates and evicting tenants to transform agriculture. The general implication of these critiques is that we need a model of commercial capitalism that allows for the reintegration of production and circulation so that one is no longer fixated on the idea that merchant, camp that merchant capital is always and inherently external to production. For this to be possible, we have to see Marx's definition of commercial capital as specific to the framework of his analysis of industrial capital and construct a circuit of commercial capital that would explain the movement of the kinds of capital exemplified by the Dutch and English East India companies, for example. They dominated world trade for a period of centuries and brought about the kind of capitalist world economy that large-scale industry took for granted when it began its own expansion in the 19th century. But when these joint stock companies were formed on the eve of the 17th century, they in turn built on the legacies of earlier and possibly less internalized forms of merchant capitalism, whose origins lie in Europe around the 12th century and elsewhere in the Islamic world and China even earlier. As a broad periodization, I would suggest that we see the 12th to 15th centuries as the period of the growth of capitalism in Europe, or Mediterranean capitalism, and the 16th to 18th centuries as a period of company capitalism marked by more brutal methods of accumulation and competition. 9.3. From corporate capitalism to the earliest capitalist forms of association. The institutional framework of industrial capitalism only emerged towards the end of the 19th century with the so-called corporate revolution. Industrial capitalism became corporate capitalism with the spread of free incorporation, limited liability, and the legal doctrine of separate personality. These were developments underpinned by a huge expansion in the scale of enterprise, the evolution of investment banks, and the financing of investments by the capital market. When Hilferding wrote Finance Capital, he described a particular national form of this development, but he was the first Marxist to do so, that is, to come to terms with the new era of corporate capitalism. Now, as Patty Ireland has shown, the doctrine of separate personality evolved against the background of legal changes that reconceptualized the share as an autonomous form of property, a separate and distinctive form of money capital. This process was more or less complete in Britain by the third quarter of the 19th century. If shareholders had no direct interest, legal or equitable, in the property owned by the company, only a right to dividends and the right to assign their shares for value, the company, by contrast, was now seen as the owner of its own assets. Separate personality severed the link between the assets of joint stock companies and their shares externalizing shareholders and depersonifying the company. In other words, before these changes and throughout the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, shares in joint stock companies, incorporated and unincorporated, were consistently conceptualized as equitable interests in the assets of the company. Shareholders were, were regarded as owners in equity of the company's property and shares as an equitable right to an undivided part of the company's assets. What this means is that there was no distinction in law between companies and partnerships. The first English partnership law treaties written in 1794 by William Watson, differentiated partnerships and companies on a purely economic basis. In the second edition of the book, published in 1807, the distinction was drawn with particular clarity. In England, Watson wrote, the first great division was into public and private partnerships. Public partnerships were usually called companies or societies and generally consisted of many members, carrying on some important undertaking for which the capital and exertions of a few individuals would be insufficient. These companies were sometimes incorporated, sometimes not. Joint stock companies, not confirmed by public authority, were, legally speaking, mere partnerships, distinguishable only by the fact that the articles of agreement between their members were usually very different.
Other treaties writers followed Watson's classifications. In short, partnerships remained the most common and dominant form of capitalist organization down to the 19th century. For example, the wealthy merchants who dominated the Glasgow tobacco trade in the 18th century, among the most successful capitalists of their time, came to form massive syndicates, which basically consisted of interlocking partnerships. According to Devine, three such groups of interlocking partnerships handled over 50% of the tobacco in the 1770s. Scottish partnerships were exceptionally conducive to accumulation, since partners were only allowed 5% interest on the value of their shares, and the vast proportion of company earnings were plowed back. The larger Glasgow firms were miniature prototypes of later private joint stock organizations, notes Devine. The same, of course, has been said about the colonial companies of the 17th century, and before them of the great Augsburg family firms of the 16th, which Strider was so impressed by. All of these enterprises were owned and controlled by merchants. It was merchant capitalism which innovated the unlimited partnership in the whole spectrum of forms of association that flowed from it. The large Italian mercantile and banking houses of the 13th to 15th centuries were relatively permanent associations, companies, with international operations, sophisticated systems of accounting and control, branch organizations, and the division of capital into shares. The Bardi of Florence had overseas representatives of, at Avignon, Barcelona, <clears throat> Bruges, Cyprus, Constantinople, Jerusalem, London, Majorca, Marseille, Nice, Paris, Rhodes, Seville, and Tunis. Although maritime trade was generally based on the single venture agreements called commenda colleganza, by the 14th century, even Venetian large-scale trade was dominated by compagnie. One of these, floated by the Corner Brothers, involved a capital of 83,275 ducats in 1365. Federico Corner, acquired the concession on massive sugarcane plantations in the south of Cyprus. With the aim of exporting refined sugar, his son Giovanni estimated some five to 6,000 ducats would be needed annually to keep this business running. By the 14th century, Venice was an economy dominated by capital, with the same families controlling trade, transport, finance, and industry. More or less the same was true of Genoa in the 15th century. Here, the largest of the stock companies and enterprise set up to extract and import alum from the east controlled a capital of 280,000 ducats in 1449. Like the corner enterprise in Cyprus, this one enjoyed a veritable monopoly. Genoese companies divided their capital into 24 shares, carats, or multiples thereof, and were run by a close-knit board of governors. More generally, shares were transmissible within the limited or within the lifetime of the company without breaking up the partnership. They were held not only by members of the families of the founders of the company and by its principal employees, who were encouraged to put their own savings into their own company, but also by other rich men. These were investors not at all concerned with the actual running of the company. In addition to the corpo, that is, the capital raised by the shareholders when a company was formed or reformed, additional capital could be put in later by, shell, by shareholders, by employees, and by outsiders. Such denarii fiori del corpo carried fixated rates of interest, like modern debentures. The sedentary merchant at home was no longer a simple individual capitalist. Thus, the evolution of the corporate form in the course of the 13th century signified an expansion in the scale of enterprise. Yet, throughout the 13th and early 14th centuries, the dominant form of association by far was the commenda or single venture agreement in which an investor, the capitalist, advanced or entrusted capital to a second part, the merchant or factor, to be used in an overseas commercial venture and returned together with an agreed share of the profit, usually three-fourths. Lozado notes that the capital was generally advanced in commodity form, that is, was commodity capital. The commenda was the chief mechanism of the capitalist expansion of trade which began in the 11th century.
and the widespread recourse to it from that time presumes substantial liquidity, an accumulation of money capital looking for investment. I shall argue that at least some of this was primitive accumulation from the raids and plundering expeditions that were common across the Mediterranean in the later 11th and 12th centuries, against the background of the Crusades. The commanda broadened the investor base and vastly expanded the scope of accumulation. It was thus typical of the more egalitarian and expansive maritime capitalism of the earliest period, when, as Krakow argues, substantial sectors of the population had a stake in the expansion of trade. Indeed, trade expansion was Europe's only way out of the growing demographic impasse, Krakow claims, and many merchants were both investors and factors that is, switched roles within the Commenda contract. The main part of the 13th century was characterized by a renewed stratification of capital, as the bigger merchants preferred to form associations only between themselves, and took decisive steps to regulate the competition of capitals in the Levant trade. A final link, whether or not Lopez was right in saying, la Commenda a, la, la commenda a une origine islamique et peut-être plus ancienne. The commenda has Islamic origins and may be even older. The fact is that the commenda constituted one of the most widespread tools of commercial activity in the Islamic world. Islamic commercial law and business practice knew both commenda agreements and investment partnerships. And as Udovich says, virtually all the features of partnership and commenda law are already found fully developed in the earliest Hanafite Legal Compendium, Shebani's Kitab al-Azul, composed toward the end of the 8th century. Thus, the major institutions of long-distance trade were firmly in place, certainly well before the end of the 8th century. But even more interesting is the implication that, that the capitalism of the Mediterranean was preceded by and could build on an earlier tradition of capitalist activity, which has so far received considerably less attention. 9.4. The Arab Trade Empire. Concepts of profit, capital, and the accumulation of capital are all around in the Arabic sources of the 9th to 14th centuries. For example, al Shafi defines the function of partnership as the expansion of capital. Al Mal was, premius, was primarily capital, not money, and whenever it is translated as money, it means capital in money form or money capital. Again, discussing the discretion allowed to agents under commenda agreements, al Saraksi writes, the investor's aim in handing over the capital to him, the agent, is the achievement of profit. In another passage where he defends the usefulness of such contracts, Saraksi says the contract is allowed because people have a need for this contract, for the owner of capital may not find his way to profitable trading activity and the person who can find his way to such activity may not have the capital, and profit cannot be attained except by means of both of these capital and trading activity. A leader writer, Cassani, distinguishes the creation of capital from its further expansion, arguing, the need for the creation of capital takes precedence over the need for its augmentation and defining partnerships as a method for augmenting or creating capital. That this vocabulary was part of the wider cultural world of Islam and not confined to the legal schools is shown by other writings. Thus, the 10th century geographer al Istakhri describes the traders of Fars in southern Persia as having a passion for the accumulation of capital. In the Kitab al Ishara, Illa Mahasin al Tajara, Handbook on the Beauties of Commerce, a manual on trade probably written in the 11th century, the author refers repeatedly to the capitalist as Sahib al-Mal, literally owner of capital. It is clear from this manual that merchants involved in, in international trade normally relied on commenda agreements and that the mukrad or factor usually received a share of the profit. Finally, in Ibn Khaldun, there is even a clear resonance of the labor theory of value or a labor th theory of value. In the Mukaddima, he states clearly that labor is the cause of profit. Human labor is necessary for every profit and capital accumulation 
while gold and silver are the only socially acceptable measures of value for all capital accumulations. <clears throat> He also defines profit as the extent by which capital increases or is increased and commerce as the striving for profit by means of the expansion of capital. The Arabs inherited the intensely urban and, by the 7th century, very largely monetized territories of late antiquity. Roman and Sasanian and integrated, integrated, what? Roman and Sasanian and integrated them into a powerful and strikingly cosmopolitan civilization whose economic resources and stability were unrivaled, except for those of China. Whatever the initial impetus behind the conquests, there is little doubt that further expansion was to some degree motivated by financial and commercial considerations. Al Baladuri reports that the conquest of Sindh in 711 brought the Arabs a net profit of 60 million dirhams by the reckoning by the reckoning the famous Umayyad government, governor al-Hajjaj is supposed to have made. Sindh was also commercially strategic, a major entrepot in the far eastern trade, which the Sassanians had traditionally dominated. The early 8th century expansion to the east was like a pincer movement, <clears throat> driving northwards to the wealthy oases beyond Khurasan and south to control of the Indian Ocean. The Arabs were seeking to dominate existing networks of trade as the Portuguese would do centuries later is proved by Al-Tabari's fascinating reference to ships from China frequenting the harbour of al Ubula in 633 on the eve of the conquest of southern Iraq. Trade with the Far East was conceivably the most lucrative sector of accumulation in the 8th to 10th centuries, generating the kind of wealth that was famously associated with Gulf ports like Basra and Saraf. In the West, the corresponding movement was Islam's commercial expansion across the Sahara to the sources of gold in the Western Sudan. This happened in the 8th century, when the Arabs broke the Berber monopoly of the Trans-Saharan routes and sparked a long period of unbroken prosperity for the towns of Morocco. Yacoubi's geography completed in 891 describes Fez as a splendid city and immensely prosperous. Sidjil Massa according to Ibn Hakal, who went there in 951, enjoyed uninterrupted trade with the Sudan, which brought in huge profits. At Autogost, he saw a letter of credit, a private transaction to the tune of 42,000 dinars, something he had never seen in the East. It is hardly surprising that the major dynasties that ruled this sector of North Africa in the 11th to 13th centuries sprang from the Islamized Berber populations of southern Morocco, and that Tlemcen, Fez, and Agmat were described by the Spanish geographer Al Idrisi as the wealthiest cities of the Maghreb. Indeed, North Africa, with its supply of gold, became the driving force of the entire Mediterranean in the 14th and 15th centuries, showing us how unconvincing it is to look at the growth of capitalism in Europe without the significant ways in which its powerful commercial background shaped its evolution. The Muslims created a vigorous monetary economy based on expanding levels of circulation of a stable high-value coinage, the dinar, and the renewed integration of monetary areas that had been distinct and indifferent to each other. This was an enormous achievement, both for the kind of economy it allowed for, the sheer extent of the monetary sector, and for its role in enabling Europe to return to gold. However we characterize that economy, it was certainly not just some loose ensemble of feudal regimes. Trade was fundamental to its structure. The growth of cities and expanding urban markets, the diffusion of new crops and explosive growth of cash cropping, rice, flax, hemp, sugarcane, raw silk, indigo, cotton, are all general indications of the remarkable commercial vitality of the 8th to 11th centuries. We know little about the market systems that sustained this huge expansion on the ground, but the 10th century geographers refer repeatedly to substantial concentrations of capital in the port towns and numerous inland centres that acted as entrepôts or wholesale markets at the intersection of converging trade routes. Towns like Saraf, 
Nishapur, and Narmasir in Iran, Bakand near Bukhara, Debul in Sindh, Medea al Medea in the Sahel, and Cordoba, Almeria, and Cuta in the Western Mediterranean were all consistently described in these terms by the geographers. For example, Ibn Hakal's description of Nishapur refers to the huge market complexes called funduks, which were occupied by wealthy merchants specializing in a single branch of commerce with huge quantities of, commodity, of commodities and large capitals. The cloth merchants were especially active here as Nishapur was a manufacturing center exporting silk and cotton fabrics as far away as Europe. Saraf, with its densely packed multi-storied teak houses, were a purely commercial site, the point of access to China, after Uman in al Mukaddasi's description. I have not seen in the realm of Islam more remarkable buildings or more handsome. They are built of teakwood and baked brick. They are towering houses, and a single house is, is bought for more than 100,000 dirhams. According to al Istekri, the merchants of Saraf spent lavishly on their homes, over 30,000 dinars in some cases. In my time, one of them acquired assets worth 4 million dinars, yet his clothes were scarcely distinguishable from those of a laborer. Debul too, on the barren coast of Sindh, just west of the Indus, were consistently described as a place of merchants. Al Mukdasi, who, vi who visited Sindh some time before 9 985, writes Debul is on the sea. The water beats against the walls of the town. It has an entirely merchant population speaking both Sindhi and Arabic. It is the port of the area, giving rise to a considerable income. In the, Med in the Mediterranean, the late, 19 or the late 10th century Persian geographer of the Hudud al Alam described Cairo as the wealthiest city in the world, extremely prosperous. The records of the Cairo Geniza show that in that century and the following, much of Cairo's commercial life was controlled by merchant houses, like that of Ibn Akal, working through a network of agents spread across the Mediterranean. Ibn Akal's firm exported large quantities of flax to Medea in the Sahel, this was both a flourishing international port and a textile center. And in the 12th century, Al Idrisi refers to its wealthy and generous minded merchants. Even further west, Almeria, with its bustling shipyards, vessels, and silk looms, was described by Al Idrisi as unmatched, in Spain at least, for the wealth, industriousness, and commercial inclinations of its people, and said to include 970 hostels for merchants from all parts of the world. Finally, scales of business. These were huge. Ships which entered the Gulf ports laden with goods from China could contain cargoes worth 500,000 dinars. Ibn Hockel notes that Kabul was a major wholesale market for indigo and tells us, the indigo that is sold every year from what is produced in the town and the surrounding countryside amounts to over 2 million dinars. According to what their merchants report, not including the stocks left with the traders of the end, at the end of the year. Again, in the second half of the 11th century, Alexandria was exporting well over 5,000 to 6,000 tons of raw flax to markets in the Mediterranean. Thus, Islam made a powerful contribution to the growth of capitalism in the Mediterranean, in part because it preserved and expanded the monetary economy of late antiquity and innovated business techniques that became the staple of Mediterranean commerce in particular partnerships and commander agreements, and also because the seaports of the Muslim world became a rich source of the plundered of the plundered money capital, which largely financed the growth of maritime, cap maritime capitalism in Europe. Indeed, Mandel stated this with unabashed bluntness when he wrote, the accumulation of money capital by the Italian merchants who dominated European economic life from the 11th to the 15th centuries originated directly from the Crusades, an enormous plundering enterprise, if ever there was one. 9.5 from Genoa to Portugal. The Fourth Crusade, 
1204 secured Venetian dominance over the East Mediterranean and consolidated the hold of the purely capitalist elements in the ruling oligarchy. In the case of Genoa, it was Lopez who argued that the ability of a largely agrarian elite to finance trade expansion and set off a chain reaction of rapid accumulation through trade and shipbuilding derived in the first instance from the huge quantities of cash acquired by the Genoese in crusading expeditions and raids on the Spanish and North African coasts. It was the war with the Arabs that gave Genoese enterprise its first decisive push. Thus, Portuguese expansion started on a classically Mediterranean model, even if its consequences were destined to end the centrality of the Mediterranean and antiquity forever. To begin with, there was a long and peculiarly Mediterranean background to the Portuguese assault on Cuda. In 1087, the Genoese led a massive raid on Medea, seized the commercial quarter, and extracted the huge sum of 100,000 dinars. Caesarea in Palestine was sacked in 1101, and 15% of the vast booty reserved for Genoa's captains and officers. Or, yep, yeah, and officers. In 1148, Sfax and other Sahel ports were seized by the Normans. In 1234, the Genoese laid siege to Cuda, demanding vast sums in reparation for losses sustained in the harbor. And in 1260, the Castilians attacked Salay on the Atlantic coast. Clearly, by the 12th century, the Christians had recovered control of the seas. Indeed, one aim of these expeditions was to secure dominance of the sea, but linked to that in driving many of these attacks were the commercial interests at stake. Above all, the drive to gain access to the gold of Ghana. The shortage of gold affected the European economies in waves all the way down to the mid-15th century. But the last quarter of the 12th century, the Genoese were heavily involved in Northwest Africa, dominating the region's external trade and directing the third largest share of their investments to the Moroccan port of Salay and a carefully concealed bid to open an Atlantic gold route. As Watson notes, it was probably this African gold reaching the shores of Italy which allowed Genoa to issue her precious gold coins at the end of the 12th century or the beginning of the 13th. From the 1250s on, the gold which flowed into Europe from the ports of North Africa and Spain largely remained in Europe. In the following decades and centuries, Genoese commercial exploration of the Atlantic expanded hugely, with major spin-offs for the problem of long-distance shipping. By the late 13th and 14th centuries, Genoa was receiving enormous quantities of gold, and during the whole of the 15th century, the gold of Ghana still reached Italy mainly through the port of Genoa. Of Genoa. Thus, Genoa prefigures Portugal in interesting ways. Indeed, it was Portugal that put a halt to Genoese expansion in Morocco and a veritable struggle for control of the gold routes. The capture of Cuda was a calculated move to subvert the entire balance of power in the Straits of Gibraltar, Gibraltar undermining the competition of the main Iberian powers, Aragon and Castile, as well as the Genoese, without the clear perception at this stage of an Atlantic strategy. The calculated imperialism of the Portuguese monarchy, which crystallized with Dom João II and his successor, Dom Manuel, was more a result than a cause of decades of exploration, which were largely driven by private and commercial interests, such as those of the big Lisbon merchant, for now, Gomes, of the Lagos merchants, who organized the earlier expedition to the Rio Grande, and of course, the private interests of the Infanti Dom Henrique, who carved out a substantial maritime estate in the Azores, a strictly commercial enterprise in the 1440s. 9.6. Company Capitalism and the Advance System. Portuguese maritime expansion transformed the nature of commercial capitalism, subsuming the legacies of the Mediterranean in a coherent imperial project of the expansion of capital as the basis of a nation's power and predominance in modern society. It was the Dutch and English companies that embodied the new kind of commercial capitalism in its pure forms. But the, but the Estado de India was not fundamentally different, and Portuguese enterprise was clearly the front runner in this, fiel in this field. 
sorry, random hiccup. On the other hand, it was the Dutch company that embodied the logic of accumulation in its purest form. For only here, in the early 17th century, was there a conscious attempt to build a permanent circulating capital, that is, generate sufficient reserves for further expansion of the business. By permanent circulating capital, Cohen meant the permanent and expanded circulation of capital mainly in the form of commodities extracted from one end of Asia to the other, and circulating between the different Asian markets where the VOC had factories. He had visualized this quasi-multilateral trading system as based formally on barter, as a great deal of, inter of international commerce was at the time, but in reality the Dutch required vast quantities of precious metals to sustain the Europe-Asia trade. By the late 17th century, they dominated the trade in Spanish silver, so that Amsterdam was the world's leading center in the trade in precious metals. Now, given that the age of company capitalism, 16th to 18th centuries, was one of ferocious commercial rivalries and repeated recourse to violence and the annexation of territories, it seems unreal to suppose that the self-expansion of commercial capital was simply grounded in some simplistic formula, like buying cheap and selling and selling dear. The stronger the competition of commercial capitals, the greater is the compulsion on individual capitals to seek some measure of control over production. Marx was clearly aware of this when he referred to the colonial system and the VOC in particular as a striking example of the manner and form in which commercial capital operates or dominates production directly. Here, the abstract antithesis between circulation and production is abandoned in a realization that mercantile companies might be involved in production in ways that contradict the concept of merchant capital as a mere mediation between extremes. But of course, today it is not sufficient to limit ourselves to a general characterization of this kind. We need a more precise morphology of the possible ways in which merchant entrepreneurs have sought control over production or organized the production of capital, that is, the forms in which circulation has dominated production. Here, it is crucial not to confuse scale with centralization. Scale refers to the volume of capital deployed by the individual capitalist, not the degree of dispersal or centralization of the labor force. The mercantile houses, which dominated the trade of colonial India in the late 18th and 19th centuries, were relatively large units of capital, but typically the mass of labor power, which they exploited, was hugely dispersed. The advanced system was the crucial mechanism which allowed this paradoxical and seemingly fragile combination of large-scale enterprise and dispersed labor power. And Bengal, in particular, provides us with some fine research on how it worked for commodities like indigo and cotton piece goods. Thus, the circulating capital visualized by J.P. Cohen as the basis of the Dutch commercial capitalist system would, would to a certain if not very large extent, have involved the circulation, investment of capital in the form of, of advances. Van Santen <clears throat> has, shown, has shown this for Dutch exports of indigo from northern India in the 1620s and 1630s, when, according to an English estimate, the VOC had 100,000 to 150,000 rupees invested each year in the variety known as Bayana indigo that is, in the advances themselves. It was through a system of, of advances that commercial capital controlled almost every commodity within Europe or outside in which it had substantial business interests. The chief exceptions to this pattern were those enterprises relatively centralized, where merchants integrated vertically through direct ownership of fixed assets, as happened in the Cuban sh sugar mills in the mid 19th century. <coughs> Our intellectual prejudice against commercial capitalism is so deeply rooted that whole swathes of the history of capitalism are ignored by Marxists, with the result that there is no specifically Marxist historiography of capitalism. This must surely count as one of the strangest intellectual paradoxes of all time, but it was not one that Mendel contributed to. Marxist economic theory is one of those rare texts that attempts to integrate history in an understanding of Marx's economic theory. Mendel was thoroughly familiar with some of the best work in medieval and early modern economic history, setting a very wide range of sources, including writers like Armando Sapori, Robert Lopez, 
and Raymond de Rouver. His chapter on the development of capital is one of our best short histories of early capitalism and signed a major role to the expansion of trade from the 11th century onward. Certainly Mandel did not subscribe to the schematic contrast between exchange and production that so fascinated Daub, and because he was too well read in European history, he refused to minimize the role of commercial capitalism. That much of this history was seen as a primitive accumulation of capital stems, of course, from the almost universal orthodoxy that writes the history of capitalism as a genealogy of industrial capital. That this is not necessarily the best perspective to adopt is suggested by the history of industry itself. The traders dominated the English coal industry in the 17th century, one of the most heavily capitalized sectors of the British economy in that period. They invented the factory system by concentrating labor in the large silk mills of northern Italy in the same century. That was itself only possible because of technological changes in silk spinning and the more advanced technology of the Bologna silk mills. They controlled the very advanced forms of enterprise found in South German mining in the 16th century and were responsible for the dramatic technological revolutions that sparked the Central European mining boom of the 15th century. Finally, they floated agricultural holding companies in Cuba in the mid 19th century and moved actively into the production of sugar through the rapid accumulation of mills, plantations, and labor forces at a time when international competition made technological advances imperative. 9.7 Concluding Note Merchant Capitalism and Labor In short, the contrast between capitalism as a commercial system and capitalism as a mode of production is schematic and overstated, and a major reason why Marxists have paid so little attention to merchant capital. In the more developed forms of, of commercial capitalism, circulation dominates production in the sense that production is controlled by a class of capitalists who remain merchants it cannot properly be classified as industrialists. The subsumption of labor into merchant capital is thus irreducible to any single formula, even though Marx tended to associate it primarily with the stage of manufacture. Merchant capitalists controlled a variety of enterprises from putting out networks and peasant agriculture to slave plantations and factories in the modern sense. The North Italian silk mills of the 17th century were among the earliest embodiments of the factory system, based on 14-hour shifts and a tight regulation of labor. On the plantations, the rapid depreciation of slave labor forces ensured slave labor forces ensured that resident planters piled up mountains of debt, financed again by merchants. As Bradell said about the Brazilian sugar plantations, it was European trade that commanded production and output overseas. If we understand this literally, it means that the subsumption of slave labor into capital involved both merchants and planters. Merchant capital shared in the economic exploitation of slaves through merchant economic control over the planters. For example, through the refaction contracts which financed the Cuban sugar industry of the second quarter of the 19th century, before the spate of acquisitions which put the Havana merchant houses in more direct control. The articulated nature of merchant capitalism is even more evident in the forms in which it typically established control over the labor of artisans and small, ple and small peasants. Under company capitalism, the circuit of merchant capital acquired its moment of reality when the money capital financing the investment, the annual list of orders sent out by the company's directors, circulated in the form of advances. Since these were usually dispersed by the company's commercial agents through local capitalists, merchants, or less often commission agents, the organization of production acquired the appearance of a chain, a hierarchy of capitals connecting a dispersed mass of labor power to the company across a series of intermediate agents. When the free merchants, i.e. European private traders intruded into this system, they operated on exactly the same basis, merely intensifying competition and the drive to enforce tighter control on the producers. Analyzing the relationship between merchants and weavers in a system roughly comparable to this, Marx wrote that this method of exploitation simply worsens the conditions of the direct producers, transforms them into mere wage laborers and proletarians under worse conditions than those directly subsumed by capital. In other words, he saw merchant capitalism transforming the whole 
transforming whole swathes of rural workers into wage laborers. So too in the Grand Race, where he wrote, the way in which money transforms itself into capital often shows itself quite tangibly in history, e.g. when the merchant induces a number of weavers and spinners who until then wove and spun as a rural secondary occupation to work for him. <clears throat> but then has them in his power and has brought them under his command as wage laborers. In short, the dispersal of production was no indication that these forms of domestic industry were not part of a network of capitalist enterprises. For Marx, the crucial mechanism in the, uh, in the subsumption of labor was the merchant's ability to undermine the independence of small producers by restricting them little by little to one kind of work in which they become dependent on selling on the buyer, the merchant, and ultimately produce only for and through him. For some Bart, this was possible because the key production factor which merchants controlled was not so much the means of production as the market. The attractive feature of this conception is that it yields a model applicable to both the verlag, verlag system and peasant agriculture. The verlag system was the dominant organizational form of early capitalism and character was the dominant organization, oh, and characterized by an almost exclusive predominance of circulating capital, severe competition between capitalists, domestically dispersed labor, and the sustained use of peace rates. It was almost certainly as widespread in the Islamic world as it became in Europe. Referring to the well-known form of advance payment, Marx seemed to define the standard case as one where in the transaction MC, money, <clears throat> money functions only in the familiar form of means of purchase. Adding, of course, capital too is advanced in the form of money, and it is possible that the money advanced is capital advanced. I've argued that under commercial capitalism, advances were the major form in which capital circulated, and that the transactions between merchants and artisans, etc., surpassed the scope of, <clears throat> of simple circulation. The Danny Meggett work was one that Marx himself outlined in the Grand Race. He, the merchant, bought their labor originally only by buying their product as soon as they restrict themselves to the production of this exchange value and thus must directly produce exchange values, must exchange their labor entirely for money in order to survive. Then they come under his command, and at the end, even the illusion that they sold him products disappears. By analyzing the advance system as a circulation of capital, we can extend this to the way in which capital took hold of agriculture. Take India, for example, if we exclude the more substantial sections of the peasantry and the purely proletarianized strata, such as the sharecroppers of Sindh or the lower tenantry of the United Provinces, much of the remaining agricultural population conforms to this model of a class subject to capitalist domination by a multitude of commercial interests, from the export houses and large wholesalers to the primary merchants and local moneylenders.